So thank you, Christine, for uh, organizing this conference and for inviting me. And thank you, C4, for hosting this. So the title of my talk now is Migration and Forest Transitions at Multiple Scales, Evidence from a Globalizing Latin America. And uh, what I've done here is basically tried to cobble together examples from my own research over the last 15 or so years in Latin America where there's some uh, evidence directly or indirectly uh, uh, linking migration with foreign forest transitions. Um, you know, my own research has to do largely with this topic, but also with other uh, population and, and health transitions as they relate to environmental change. Um, but so again, what I'm, what I'm attempting to do here is really to focus in on the topic of this workshop. How are migration and forest transitions linked? Um, giving due respect to what we don't know, and uh, in some cases, I mean, it, 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 to some degree, even hand waving about potential linkages, right? Um, given uh, some of the things that we do know, um, <clears throat> there's sort of no easy way to um, organize uh, these rather disparate um, empirical studies that I've conducted. Um, around this theme, so I've kind of gone, I'm a geographer, so I'm starting sort of at the macro scale, more or less, and then going down to small scale to look at some of these links. There's um, a th three framing concepts uh, that I'd like to introduce, uh, integrating migration and forest transitions. The first is that despite all of the world's net population growth projected to occur in the world's poorest cities uh, from here until 2100, the pace, magnitude, and geography of rural demographic transitions will have a disproportionate effect on global population size and distribution. So um, Cecilia showed the other day in her talk how uh, she mentioned also that UN projections indicate that most um, population growth, or all population growth, will happen in urban areas. Um, it's more than just that. It's that uh, all of the net growth will occur in the world's poorest cities. But this is going to happen despite, oh, all right, we have contact. This is going to uh, unfold despite um, rapid uh, um, urbanization. Th this will be largely, uh, well, as Cecilia pointed out too, the majority of this change, uh, of the source of this population growth will remain rural areas, OK? So uh, that is why rural demographic transitions are going to have such an outsized impact on uh, future uh, global population size and distribution. And the second point I think that's important integrating migration forest transitions is this. Um, just to put it simply sort of uh, in, in one phrase, how many people eating what produced where will describe the vast majority of future forest change on the face of the earth. And uh, point three is that point one will have a huge influence on point two. So what do I mean by this? This is, I think, a very illustrative um, histogram showing uh, population growth um, by decade, starting uh, with the uh, more or less the beginning of the um, uh, Industrial Revolution, and then projected out to 2100. And what we observe here is that whereas population growth in the world's wealthier nations, Europe, North America, uh, peaked by the middle of last century, now it's declining and that uh, the bulk of the world's total population and its growth is uh, happening in developing regions. And one thing that I can't emphasize enough is that although population projections have um, basically been revised downward over the last uh, several years, as developing regions have progressed through the, the demographic transition more rapidly than demographers anticipated, the huge error bar around how many people we will be is uh, precisely in the remote rural regions of developing countries, precisely where there's, guess what, forests. We don't really have data on these people. So, you know, um, one, one thing to take home from this is that, yes, the, the projections have been um, uh, revised downwards. Are they, are, should they be? Should they be? Probably they should, but as much as they are, I don't know. And then the other thing is that, you know, uh, if you understand how population growth works, kind of like the way uh, stocks grow, you know, uh, uh, geometrically rather than arithmetically, um, that uh, a, a, an anomalous area in the demographic transition, right, in terms of lagging in the demographic transition, can have a huge outsized impact over time in terms of the world's total population. 
And this is not just um, uh, this is this is not something that's just trivial. In that, um, certainly, remote rural places, uh, many of them do have remaining high fertility, uh, and in some cases, whole countries still do, such as Niger. So why research tropical deforestation? I, I don't need to preach to the choir here, uh, but approximately one fifth of the world's large intact old growth forests uh, remain uh, from uh, approximately several thousand years ago. Why do I start with approximately 8,000 years ago with this graph, which would probably make many geographers blanch, but you know, it's just a rough, it's just to give you an idea. Um, why 8,000 years ago? What's happening then? It's a thing called the agricultural revolution. <laughs> And if you're concerned about forests, then you know, it's important to understand that uh, with due respect to you know, many different kinds of forest uh, systems and, and human uses of them, by far the hugest imprint of human occupation on the Earth's surface has been the conversion of forests to agriculture. So if we, uh, the estimates here are very rough, so, but if we're just gonna throw out some general numbers in terms of the Earth's surface, which is very much the domain of, of geographers, you know, what's going on the Earth's surface. Um, maybe more or less 30% is in some sort of forest. Um, maybe 30% or so is uh, producing food. Um, and maybe somewhere between 35, 40% of the remaining land is uh, you know, frozen or desert or somehow you know, mountainous or wetlands or somehow not easily uh, or preferably used for agricultural production. And well under 1% is in human infrastructure in urban areas, okay? So, so let's take a step back here for a second and say, well, then around a third more or less is in production for foodstuffs. Um, well, over three quarters of that is in livestock or in crops to feed livestock. And so that is really the big human imprint on, on our service and certainly on forests. So why do we care about the demographic transition? How does this relate? Uh, one thing that I, I can't emphasize enough is that, you know, it, both in the popular, sort of popular media knowledge, um, but also among de demographers. Well, you know, what's the big deal in demography right now? It's urbanization, right? This is what you hear about. It's all about urbanization. And in fact, you know, we are, as I mentioned earlier, revising downwards our population estimates because the pace of urbanization has exceeded our, uh, what we anticipated. That's the developing world. In the developed world, what's the big story? Aging. Right? So we're shrinking our population, and so that's the big deal, right? Yeah, except, you know, these, these, these transitions are happening and unfolding really at different rates in different places. So this is some work I did with WWF, uh, looking at population change in and around their uh, core conservation areas. And I made this uh, index of uh, relative progression along the demographic transition. Uh, red is basically scarcely begun the demographic transition. They, you know, very few of the variables related to um, uh, demographic development uh, have occurred yet. And then, so you have places such as the vast Congo Basin, second largest uh, tropical forest in the world, where, uh, you know, demographic transition has scarcely begun, if at all. And then nearby in South Africa, if you've been to Joburg or, you know, Cape Town, the demographic transition is, um, you know, similar to what it is in North America or Europe. So um, this, this, this is uh, quite interesting, I think. Um, that we're right now living in a time that is unique demographically. Never happened before, and very likely it will never happen again. And we're in it right now. And that is that we have these two worlds. We have places where the demographic transition, as we define it, has largely um, uh, been completed, other places where it's scarcely begun. We have that huge transition across space happening right now. And so what, what took a couple hundred years for North America and Europe to go through in this transition of high mortality and high fertility to eventually low mortality and low fertility um, is happening in developing countries, in some cases in, uh, in just decades. Where it's happening, where it's not, is going to be a huge predictor of future forest transitions, but increasingly in indirect ways, and I'll get to that in a second. So Latin America, where um, I've done most of my work and which is gonna be the topic of some of the empirical research here, um, is a place that uh, I think also is surprising to some people that know Latin America that it's largely urban. It's you know, 75, 80% urban like North America and Europe. Is you talk about like the Southern Cone, you know, Chile, Uruguay, Argentina, uh, they're even in some ways a bit more further ahead in some cases of the demographic trans transition than the United States. But there still remain pockets where um, it's very early in the transition, high fertility, high particularly infant mortality, 
And guess what? These are places, not surprisingly, uh, it's not coincidental, um, near um, high conservation priority forests. So <coughs> what I did, <coughs> excuse me, with this talk is to basically ask questions for kind of probing questions. Um, these are not you know, well thought, I, I did this last night, um, but sort of linking to some of the research I've done to these questions of migration and forest transitions. What do we, do, what do we know, what don't we know? Just a first attempt to link, again, some of these questions with some of my own research. Um, so my question one is, how and where do dynamic migration landscapes, both rural destination and origin areas, relate to demographic transitions? And so in a sense, we're talking about, because these ultimately will affect also forest change. So here I'm talking about this link of demographic change to another kind of demographic change to ultimately forest change. Um, and so I'm going to report just briefly on some work uh, I've been doing with colleagues at the Carolina Population Center since I was in graduate school there in the 90s on um, forest change and land use change in the Ecuadorian Amazon. And just for the purpose of this question, I'm focusing on fertility change. And during the 1990s, uh, we found that the total fertility rate, which is the number of average number of children uh, per woman during her reproductive years, her life cycle, fell from around seven to four during the 1990s. Now again, think about in the US, US how long did it take for this, um, for this decline to happen? Well, the uh, fertility rate was around six, then it went up to seven, particularly with Western expansion, land availability, increased fertility in the US, just like we see in these areas now. And then um, over about 150 years, you know, 100, 150 years, it got to four, and now it's around two. So this is a change that happened again in North America, 100, 150 years, here, 10 years. Uh, in some ways, this is a sort of a classic story of the uh, oil um, discovery and then infrastructure development, transportation infrastructure, and then spontaneous settlement, which we've seen in other places throughout Latin America. And we've published quite a bit of research on this topic, uh, but again, here I'm focusing on fertility transition. So th this transition, which took so long to happen in, in North America and Europe, and was more rather homogenous across space, in the developing world, as I was trying to show you with some of the uh, uh, maps um, earlier from Africa and North America, can happen very quickly and in very close proximity. So here we have Lago Agrio, which is one of these uh, rainforest cities, which has sprouted up uh, over the last few decades in the Amazon, where the total fertility rate now is well below four. If you literally cross the river, the fertility rate is over seven. So this never happened before in, in North America and in Europe, where you had places right next door to each other where the fertility rate was so different. And what's the connection with forest transitions? Well, you know, the causal arrow in some ways goes both ways. And I just, I just want you to be aware of this. Um, there's not a lot of research on this, but you know, I think it's fairly compelling the, the, what is out there, that um, you know, availability of land for households that, for whom land is the primary resource does have an impact on how many children you have. So uh, amount of land with land increase, it was very positively associated with um, increased um, number of children born and whether a child was born or not, logistic regression. So moving on to um, a similar topic of, uh, of origin and destination regions and how um, uh, these, these uh, processes can affect fertility. This is some work uh, I did with Jason Davis, who's now at the Carolina Population Center, on remittances and the effect of remittances in Guatemala and some highland communities where we researched this on um, land use and fertility and consumption. And so we asked, is there a relation between a rise in remittances among households and a reduction in fertility? We also wanted to know if there was a change in, in land use. We saw no notable change in land use. This is just a couple of case studies. Uh, around, uh, I think we had 80, a sample of 85 randomly sampled households in two communities. Um, and we didn't see a notable reduction in fertility either yet. But interestingly, something we did find that emerged from this research that surprised us was um, that a, one of the first things that households invested in was education for their children. And um, 
a lot of the research we had seen in South America showed that, uh, for example, Brad Jokic's work in Ecuador, that people were investing, kind of putting their capital almost in their house, household construction, right? Um, you know, they don't, uh, at least you know, until recently, don't have bank accounts, so they're kind of investing in their household and in their land. We didn't see that. Here we saw people investing in their children. So here, uh, you know, of course, education is the highest, is the, 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 the strongest predictor, uh, at least um, underlying predictor, of fertility decline. So over time, we do think that, it, you know, if this is true in other cases, uh, you know, investing in children's education will, over time, reduce fertility, which can, or, or might not, but in a direct way, all, thing, all other things being equal, might reduce pressures on the forest. Second question, how do coupled urban and nutrition transitions in one place affect forest transitions elsewhere? And why there? So we have these two worlds that I talked about demographically, right? The urban world and then the world that's more rural. And remember, I think Cecilia also mentioned that since, is it uh, 2008 or nine, the world became 50% urban. And, um, <coughs> But you know that belies again this this real dichotomy where we have places like um, North America, Europe that's you know 80% urban, and places uh, like rural Africa, and still many parts of uh, Latin America also that are well well below 50% urban, and these two worlds are associated with sort of two kinds of pathways when we're trying to link migration to forest change. Pathway one: remaining high population growth, more likely to be rural rural moves. Low technology, low yields, poverty, subsistence, and people dying uh, of infectious disease. And pathway two, declining population growth, or already stable, urbanization, or already urban. With that, uh, incremental increase uh, in um, disposal income, increased meat and consumption and animal protein consumption, uh, produced not necessarily where they are anymore, usually not, but through high yield corporate agriculture um, with high technology um, and with this increased uh, diet with sugar fat, animal protein and people dying of degenerative diseases. So this is work that um, Mitch Aid led uh, on our CNH project that he, he presented some work on. Um, so you basically saw another version of this map before. Uh, significant areas of deforestation and significant areas of uh, reforestation in Latin America uh, during the first decade of uh, 2000. And um, we may try to talk a little bit of this trend, so I'll, I'll discuss how this may or may not be related to migration. Um, as Mitch and others have shown, you know, we have um, rural migration that, or rather uh, population growth in rural areas um, in Latin America by the early 1990s, late 1980s, actually started to decline, whereas urban population has sort of, you know, continued in its linear ascent, and some places even lost rural, uh, lost population growth during the 1990s. Much of Latin America now has a declining rural population. Um, and this is something that many of you working, certainly in Brazil, understand. So we, uh, this is a, uh, a conference paper that we did in, for Ari in Arizona, I think, for the um, land change meeting. Uh, we looked at the uh, relationship between population change and the municipal level, 16,000 of them. Uh, for Latin America and woody vegetation change, we found nada, R squared of 0 0.000. This is about you know, as low a correlation as you can find. So then we, then we, do we conclude then that there's no relationship between population change and forest transitions? Well, if we just look at that data at that scale, we would. Um, but things are more complex. Um, we have in um, southern uh, or central South America, southern Brazil and northern Argentina, Paraguay, um, the growth of soybeans and export agriculture. We have in northern Mexico and also here in northeast Brazil, uh, increased precipitation and some forest regrowth based on that. And then we still have some, oops, excuse me, some remaining areas such as in Mesoamerica and also along the slopes of the Andes and the Amazon where there's still this sort of pathway one, largely poverty related and still high population growth for rural migration, subsistence based uh, forest change. Um, and so one of the things that we found was that uh, pig and poultry production globally and soybean production are both soaring, and we wondered if these things are related to forest change in South America. 
So we uh, did a regression where we looked at various variables related to forest change in these 16,000 municipalities. And we also um, looked at the second level effects potentially of state and biome. And we found that um, beef production was the largest predictor, beef production um, at, the st at the national level of uh, deforestation and mitigating reforestation, uh, the biggest predictor uh, in land use was, was soy production. So if we break this down by uh, the, where the, these products are being shipped, we see that Russia is purchasing a lot of this, the US, and then followed by these countries, and the production is very large in Brazil, followed by Argentina, Mexico, Colombia, and Uruguay. In terms of beef, the majority of the beef is consumed uh, within Latin America, so the rising affluence uh, largely in urban areas in Latin America uh, within that region is uh, related to, uh, apparently, um, it seemed to be related to increasing uh, meat and animal protein consumption. In terms of soy, much of it is going to China and the Netherlands, which is probably a proxy for larger EU distribution and other European nations, produced largely in Argentina, Brazil, followed by Paraguay, Bolivia, and Uruguay. Um, We've had a lot of soy here while I've been uh, visiting Indonesia. What percent of soy do you think is eaten directly by humans that's produced? One percent. One percent. Now, it, and th this is not scientific research. This is the industry re reporting this, actually. The one percent. And so the rest of it is going to uh, for, uh, largely for animal field, also for oils. Um, and so, you know, then the question is, you know, is, is the land change in, within Latin America that we see internally is unrelated, at least at the municipal level, with population change? Is it really unrelated to population change? Well, you know, this data is showing us that it might be related to another kind of population change, something that's going on in another place, another time, not just, you know, sheer numbers, but what that population is doing. So um, virtually all of the soy that's shipped to China is fed to pigs and poultry. And we know that China has added over 100 million people to urban areas over the last couple decades. And with that has been a, a, a sharp uptick in the consumption of uh, meat products, particularly pigs and chicken, not so much beef, although increasingly, yes, beef is, is becoming important as well. So <clears throat> it's a migration process, rural to urban, which facilitates um, a increase in disposable income vis-a-vis -vis, um, urban-based employment which changes diets and demand for foodstuffs. And in a sense, what we see is that an exporting of the agricultural frontier to Latin America from China. So population, including migration trends, are very much related to forest transitions, but increasingly with greater distance in space and time between those population and related drivers and land change outcomes. So scale is really important as an analytical lens, clearly. Um, you know, we can, this is a classic example of the ecological fallacy where you know, we ask, if, is population related to the change? It seems like we have a pretty good um, um, uh, study to, to, to examine that question. Came out with nothing, but if we look at the larger scale, um, both, both uh, smaller scale and larger scale, we see how population does, does uh, relate to the land change. Um, so another way to look at this is through the um, individual or the household as a consumer, producer, and as a migrant. So this leads into a third question. <clears throat> How do household decisions simultaneously and or sequentially, proximately and distally, distally in space and time, how might they affect forest transitions? Why and, and when and why there and, and why then? So it, one way to look at these issues is that um, a household or an individual is in any given place is, um, is living within a context of macro scale demographic, political, economic, social, and ecological dynamics. And they make choices uh, based on these um, pressures and these um, contexts and these opportunities. And there'll be variation in this. Um, a response for a rural household can be to seek off farm labor. It can be to decide to have more or fewer children. It could be to manage land differently, or it could be to migrate. And um, these different options uh, uh, are related to different outcomes and different, uh, particularly different outcomes related to forest. So if a choice is to migrate, one can migrate to different areas, internationally, urban destination. When a household decides to migrate to a rural destination, return to the top of the chart, there's 
a greater likelihood that you're going to have this like, sort of pathway one deforestation process. This leads me to question four. So how do different migration patterns and stages affect forest frontiers, both internal and external? So I think it's important to distinguish between these two different kinds of frontiers. Um, this pattern of the poverty, high population, subsistence agriculture um, is um, often um, the, the, the early stages of this is often at the external frontier. Um, as these frontiers develop, then the remaining uh, force is actually on people's farms. Or uh, if it's a corporation, similarly, the remaining force within those farms. And so these are really different contexts and very different questions you have to ask to understand forest change. If we're talking about the internal frontier where people already are farming, where people already are impacting forests, then, you know, as you've seen many, many, many studies, for example, the Amazon researching what predicts deforestation, we, people, uh, researchers will go in and survey hundreds of households and they'll do regression analyses of the household characteristics related to the farm, the farming, right, and how much forest they have left. And um, that's fine and you can, you, know, you can get a high predictive value for that for what will, um, what predicts how much forest is left remaining on farms, the internal frontier, but you still don't get at the you know, vast unoccupied forest still. You know, to get at that question, you have to understand um, who's not there. Why are they not? Who could be there in the future, whether it's people or, or corporations? And that's a very different research question and research method to, to uh, adequately address that. So a fifth question, how, where, and under what conditions do remittances affect origin for escapes? This is some work that Jason Davis and I did using the LAMP data, Latin American Migration Project, by, um, started by Doug Massey, a demographer at Princeton, um, where we have several hundred households um, in most countries uh, for Latin America, Central America rather, and there's very detailed information including on land use, um, and so uh, we wanted to ask, using this data, how might remittances be related to uh, land use and, and other outcomes. And um, we found that the international migration and the sending of remittances correlated with an increase in land and pasture purchases, but did not uh, relate to changes in agricultural intensification methods. This is a small data set, but you know, we're, not, uh, we're unaware of uh, many other studies doing this. And um, you know, if, if this sort of um, result is replicated, uh, you know, I think it has potentially profound implications for forest transitions. Um, of course, pasture has you know, a much greater impact uh, on forests than other kind of land uses, uh, given the return in yields. Sixth question, where and why does scale, space, and place matter? So this is... Um, a, an image of, uh, from several years ago of Guatemala at the municipal level. Um, and this is land in forest. And some of you may be familiar with the Maya rainforest. There's lots of forest there, very little forest along these rich volcanic slopes uh, in southern Guatemala. And so prima facie, you look at the situation of Guatemala and you say, well, this is a situation of land for people, for people without land, this is a map of population density. So you see a lot of migration from high population dense areas to low population dense areas, low forest um, cover to high forest cover. And we, we looked at this topic um, both using uh, multi-level regression with the, the um, second level being the um, the departamento, first level being the municipio. We also looked, we did globally weighted regressions, spatial uh, regressions. And, um, you know, we basically found that we had both the pathway one and the pathway two process where we'd expect it happening. But do local dynamics then of forest change reflect these national and continental patterns? So this is work uh, I've been doing for the last 15-ish years in uh, the Maya Bias Reserve, particularly in this core conservation area known as the Sierra de la Candon National Park and the Lacandon boasts the richest biodiversity in the Maya Biosphere Reserve. It receives quite a bit of rainfall and also has quite a bit of relief. Um, but uh, one thing that I want to point out here, and this is related to this uh, uh, seventh research question, is, you know, where are roads built? <laughs> you know, it's something that we sort of, there is some research, the, there's, a, particularly economists have done some research on this. Um, but, uh, you know, where roads are built are not random. So it's an important question to ask because uh, without roads, uh, it's very difficult that there's penetration in the forest in a meaningful way for real uh, agricultural-driven forest conversion. 
So this is the road, uh, that Naranjo Road in 1987. This is an aerial photograph. You can see that in 87, uh, a French oil company built this road in actually the mid to early 1980s. You can see some farms starting to spread up along the road. And if you fix your gaze on this bend in the road down here, that's here, and there's a composite image of deforestation during the, up through the 90s, and then after 1990 up until uh, 2000. And you can see that um, a lot of the forest was, was cleared during this time, about 10% of the park was deforested. And you can see there's sort of a, a standard pattern of the uh, maize-based corn, swidden farming, and sort of each one of these blotches kind of represents um, a, a maize plot. Uh, um, farmed by a household. There's an anomalous blotch here, which is also one household, uh, but it's a different land use. What's going on here? This is cattle. So, you know, scale matters and what a household is doing with the land matters. We wondered what would happen. So we have this pattern of deforestation. This is the supposedly a core conservation area in the Maya Biosphere Reserve, and then you have this, but much of it is now deforested or um, compromised, and so we really have this area here that remains in, in large intact tracts of forest. We wondered, well, you know, are people going to still keep moving further and further into the forest where now it's quite a long walk to the roads? Uh, is it worth it to people? What's going to happen? So this is 2005 to 2007, and sure enough, we, we did see people moving even further into the forest. So, you know, roads, in a sense, collapse space. Um, you know, uh, I'm a UCSB geographer, and we have a, the famous geographer Waldo Tobler, who you know has his first love geography that places closer to others are more similar than those that are farther apart. It seems kind of obvious, you know, you know, in, in a real sort of uh, obvious way. Of course, you know, this this makes sense. But but any of us who study these sort of uh, dynamics understand that you know place is important too, and uh, you know roads. The the impact of a road really changes our dimensionality of what space means. I mean, all of a sudden, it it, it opens up um, these frontiers. So to understand um, basically the pace and magnitude location of deforestation in this park uh, for my dissertation, I started field work here in the mid 90s, interviewed several hundred households and um, household heads and wives. And then uh, a doctoral student of mine, Laurel Suter, followed up in 2009 with her dissertation and followed up in the same households. And we're doing a third survey now next summer. And we did the surveys in Spanish, and about a quarter of the households speak Maya, almost all of them Kekchi Maya, and we, so we did those in Kekchi. And this is the average farm in 1998, and you can see we're talking internal frontier, lots of forest in the internal frontier. So there's still sort of, from a forestry perspective, these plots, these farm plots are still of interest. By 2009, it's only 10 years, you see that most of the forest has been eliminated, and you have a very extensive Sweden which again um, is uh, indicative of you know, what sort of land use will have very potentially different impacts on the forest. Eighth question, how, when, and where do demographic, political, economic, and ecological factors help contextualize or explain some of these forest transitions? So yes, demographic impact or, uh, factors are important on the frontier. Um, the fertility rate actually up through the 90s was about eight, which is as high as any place you can find on the planet, even historically, and larger households uh, here were associated with more forest clearing, and you know this has been also replicated in in other similar places in the Amazon. Um, the transition here, uh, as an aside, I I when the fertility rate is so high, and you want to look at fertility transitions, um, you look at a, you know an eight of a TFR, and you say, "Gosh, well, it hasn't begun, right?" So this is another way of getting at this: um, that if there's high desired family size. If the desired family size remains also, for example, eight, that's really at the earliest stage of the demographic transition, which we have found in places, not here, but like Madagascar, Niger, rural places, yes, the t desired fertility rate is still seven or eight. But in the 90s, in the Lacandon National Park in Guatemala, the desired fer uh, fertility rate, or number of children, was three among women and about four to five among men. So uh, this has real implications for uh, what, what, A, more equitable decision making among men and women in a household, the impact that can have on family size, uh, and also the potential impact of, um, of you know, basically providing education and health access to people in remote areas. 
Political economic factors are also important. You know, proximity to markets and capital matter and has different impacts on the forest, as you might expect. Uh, one perverse example uh, of, of political economic factors was uh, the issue of land titling, which uh, from the ag econ literature, many, uh, one might expect that it would lead to uh, more conservative land use. Uh, instead, it led to agricultural expansion because with land title, uh, farmers, this is on the edge of the park where they're given land title in some instances, they uh, often use that land title as uh, leverage for loans, and with the loans, they purchase cattle. Ecological factors are important. Um, low, you know, high population growth, but low population density, you know, leads to expensive farming. Um, there's cultural differences as well. Uh, and here, you know, temporal scale is important as well. Because if you had just gone here in the 90s and you would ask farmers, you know, about their land use, you'd see that the Maya farmers were clearing more forest because they had a more expensive Sweden. Um, but if you go back into the 2000s, you see that now the Ladino, the non-indigenous farmers, have cleared more forest because they're more likely to adopt cattle. This leads me to a ninth question. Are frontier migrants more likely to move to another frontier? You know, are these already sort of, in a sense, pre-selected for? So we asked people uh, in the follow-up in 2009, uh, in the household, how many people have moved out and where have they gone? And uh, amazingly, just in that 10-year period, only about 63% remain in the same town. This is a very dynamic frontier. And this gets back to my household diagram, you know, in which, sort of borrowing from Kingsley Davis and the multiphasic responses, these are very dynamic people, very dynamic households. They might be forest once, and then several years later, they might be clearing forest in a new frontier. And in fact, nearly 10% were doing precisely that. And you think, well, 10%, that's not very many. And maybe not, but you know, it's actually many times more uh, people, uh, percentage-wise, that are doing a rural, rural move than we would see globally or elsewhere in Guatemala. So how important are rural migrants in rural origin areas to forest transitions? And who are these migrants? Where do they come from? And why? And why do they leave? So this is sort of a follow-up to this research. Um, you know, I could describe deforestation in the park uh, based on the several hundred household surveys, come up with an R-square in terms of predicting uh, forest cover, in terms of predicting different land use outcomes, explain anywhere between two-thirds to uh, three quarters of the variation among households in land use, okay, and thus in deforestation, forest cover. But of course, there's a 100% correlation between people being there at all, in the first place, and forest clearing. So roads uh, are a, in a sense, in this case, a necessary but insufficient condition, right? You know, why do people leave origin areas to go to this remote <coughs> frontier that's malaria infested, there's no drinking water, there's no infrastructure, the kids can't go to school, they don't go to school, there's no healthcare, you know, why would you do that? And so this is an important point, most don't. So, you know, this is sort of a needle in a haystack in, uh, effect. You have a tiny, tiny fraction of rural migrants that have a really, really outsized impact per capita on the forest. And so, you know, from a political, economic, institutional standpoint, you can say, well, it's obvious why people are leaving, right? I mean, you have, you know, the most skewed land distribution in Latin America. Brazil's right up there. Um, for example, you have about 2% of the population controlling about three quarters of the land in a country about the size of Ohio. But unlike Ohio, which has Cincinnati and Cleveland, right, and all these cities, you know, Guatemala remains about 50% rural. Almost all of those rural inhabitants are indigenous. And certainly almost all the rural inhabitants are farmers. Well, you know, that's, in a sense, a real uh, population slash land um, pressure that's building up. And on top of that, you had an extended civil war that displaced over a million people during the, 19, uh, it just ended officially in the mid-1990s. I mean, so you have these sort of institutional macro structural uh, conditions for out-migration. But nonetheless, most people don't migrate. They don't, despite this, in a tiny, I mean, we're talking just several thousand households that move to the Maya Basra Reserve and have that impact. Um, so who are these people and where do they come from? And so using the same sort of household model, we're asking this question based on all these different factors, why and, and under what conditions do people decide to migrate and when they do so to another rural destination, a remote rural destination. So to ask this question, triangulating three data sources, including my own, went to the 30-ish, uh, I think it was 28 actually, um, municipalities of highest out-migration to the Maya Biosphere Reserve, and found that about 10% of men and women 
during the 1990s had outmigrated at all. And now, again, I'm selecting for areas of highest outmigration to my biosphere reserve. And even in those places, again, of highest outmigration, only about 10% outmigrated during that decade. And of those 10%, only about a third outmigrated in search of other land. So we can surmise from this that, again, in the, in the 28 municipalities of highest outmigration to the Maya Biosphere Reserve, less than 5% move to the Maya Biosphere Reserve. I mean, this is very, very few people. So I think it's, in terms of the importance of, uh, for, for forest policy, to the extent that they're, yes, the world is shifting toward this sort of pathway two, and we'll get to that in a minute, but to the extent that there's still a remaining pathway one, who these people are, where they come from, their individual characteristics, and their, 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 their sort of you know, macro community st uh, structural conditions are, I think, quite important. You can have a lot of potential bang for your buck in investing in targeting those locations. So why did some people migrate to the Maya Biosphere Reserve? There's some common denominators, uh, as you might imagine. Uh, these are, in many ways, um, rural subsistence farmers that are, that are eking out a living in, under very difficult conditions. Ecological conditions, they are more likely to be located on steep slopes, uh, areas prone to erosion or flooding. Um, they tend to be in areas um, where there's skewed land distribution. They tend to be larger families, uh, more likely indigenous. Um, quite a few came from places where there has been expansion in you know, corporate land holdings. And this is an interesting slide that says, any of you speak Spanish, pide mas? Have another one? And you have this sign that says, but don't park here. Uh, and these are you know, these manicured lawns. Uh, and as far as the eye can see, in the Pacific Slope of Guatemala, these really rich, dark, uh, basaltic, uh, volcanic soils, you know, it's just in sugarcane, pretty much uh, to the horizon. So there's some structural reasons for this. But are origin places of these migrants different, and why? And w what are policy implications of that? And are, are, are you know, so we've, we've talked about some characteristics of the people and the places, but can these still unfold differently in different places? Now I'm putting on my place geography hat. Um, so lots of different case studies. I'll just give you two, because I have no idea how much time I have. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So here are two, these are two municipalities of, of high out migration to the Maya Biosphere Reserve during the 80s and 90s, no longer. Uh, we have Morales uh, and we have Nueva Concepcion. And Morales, uh, this municipality grew more quickly than any other during the 1950s in Guatemala. Uh, the population doubled. Why? Because United Fruit had expanded land holdings there. We're talking about you know, post-World War II consumption, baby boom and consumption boom in Europe and North America. People want to eat bananas and you have now technology that enables that with you know, refrigerated big shipping uh, containers. And so United Fruit gobbled up a lot of great land in Morales, and then you have a doubling of the population because there's a great demand for labor. People flood in. Quite a few, by the way, from this area uh, in and near Nueva Concepcion, Pacific Coast. Um, but within a decade, all of a sudden, the migration pattern reversed. You had this area of highest in-migration in the whole country to very rapid out-migration, many to Paten, initially to Southern Paten, and then to the Maya Bias Reserve. What happened? Why is that? Well, you know, as many of you know who work in rural areas, um, these kinds of jobs on plantations are often seasonal, uh, low paying. And so, um, you know, farmers who uh, relied on these jobs still needed to be subsistence farmers to maintain their families. And so with United Fruit <coughs> gobbling up the best land, you know, there just simply wasn't enough land for survival. The jobs were insufficient. So, you know, one policy implication of this is, you know, is our jobs the answer? You, you provide uh, apparently sufficient jobs. Um, but, you know, there's a quality to this too. It's not just quantity. What kind of jobs? And so, even if we double the number of jobs, you'd still have out migration here because you wouldn't have of those kinds of jobs. People wouldn't have land to compensate to at least grow some subsistence corn. So, another, you know, popular. Um, policy prescription for the developing world um, to uh, alleviate inequalities, and particularly among rural farmers, is to redistribute land. And Nueva Concepcion was one of two municipalities in Guatemala that, uh, that during the 1950s did exactly that, um, carrying out the, uh, the dream of um, Jacob Arbenz, the president who was, who was assassinated. Um, and um, so Nueva Concepcion, in 1952, 
um, some large land holdings were redistributed among several thousand households. Each household was, was given 25 hectares. And in the intervening period from 1952 through the 1990s, there was the, um, basically this land redis redistribution and the rules governing it were quite strictly adhered to and there was no further um, land consolidation as is you know, very uh, common in other places. And yet, from 1952 to the mid-90s, the average farm size splintered from around mid-20s, 25 hectares or so, to only around three hectares. So how could that be? What happened? It's no land consolidation. It's a really rare case where you can isolate that. It's because the fertility rate remained high. And people are married. Remember also in this demographic transition, one of the transitions that people don't think about often, which is really critical, is that marriage age gets older as this transition occurs. So not only do you go from having seven children you know, to two children, but you go from starting to have your, your family at you know, age 30, 35, instead of age 14, 15, 16. So you, know, you literally have, even with the same fertility rate, double the number of people living at any given time when the age of marriage is 15, 16, 17. And so you know, within just a few decades, you have basically uh, a splintering of land from around 25 hectares per household to three, you know, really isolating high fertility as, as the cause. So was land distribution the answer? It was insufficient. Land distribution without taking into account these demographic processes was, was insufficient. And these are just two reasons why place matters. So is this a sunrise or sunset over Latin America's forests? As uh, I came to this stop sign in southern Guatemala, which says here, stop. Here it says two ways this way, and then one way this way. Um, I'm unsure. Uh, but, but I am sure of one thing, and that is that um, migration transitions will continue to be intimately related to forest transitions, that there's still a pathway one that we need to be aware of. It'll be increasingly, it'll be very important in terms of our uh, understanding future transitions, both directly, how many people are still living this pathway one, right, it's still in that world, and having indirect impacts in space and time, and what will be the timing, pace, magnitude of that population becoming urban? Is it inexorable? Demographers seem to think so. Is it though really? Is there some spatial variation in that? And what is the implication of that for forests? You know, how soon these, or if at all, populations uh, live in urban areas and start having impacts through the path, pathway too. That's it. I look forward to going to the gardens, anyone who wants to go. Yeah. <laughs>